A spiritual leader who is uncovered to be a cult leader is most likely also a covert malignant narcissist. Cult leaders tend to be narcissists, and the bigger the enterprise or following they have, the greater the likelihood they are malignant or psychopathic. These types of people naturally create cults, even if the cult is their own family. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the subtle and hidden traits that separate a true spiritual leader from the covert malignant narcissist masquerading as a spiritual leader. Now, this is not about creating skepticism or suspicion in the church, ministry, or community you're part of, since there are many ministers out there who have beautiful, authentic hearts and who love God and his people, but Jesus does warn us about wolves in sheep's clothing. So this video is to help you to be vigilant and at the same time as innocent as a dove and as shrewd as a snake. For those of you who are new to my channel, I'm Shanine Megji. Welcome to my channel on Toxicity is Not Your Destiny, where I put out videos on how to navigate toxic relationships in your life from a biblical, practical, and spiritual perspective so if you'd like to receive regular content from me on this subject, subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell so that you can be notified every time I upload a video. So without further ado, let's dive into the topic. In today's age of deception, there are many who will proclaim that they are God's anointed or God sent one to the world. How can you discern a true shepherd from a malignant narcissist in ministry or a cult leader? I've covered related topics in other videos, such as 10 signs that your church might be turning into a cult or 10 subtle signs of spiritual abuse. So do check those videos out because they do fill in some of the foundational signs that I don't cover in this video. In this video, I cover more nuanced and subtle dynamics to watch out for since covert malignant narcissists are very difficult to detect. I also created a handy checklist out of all these videos that you could use as a tool to gauge if you are in a cultish or spiritually abusive environment. So to access it, click on the link in the description box below. It's crucial for me to clarify that when I talk about a covert malignant narcissist, I'm not referring to individuals who might be emotionally immature or occasionally make mistakes. I'm not even addressing leaders who may display traits like pride or self-centeredness or a desire for attention, which can be considered narcissistic. What I'm specifically addressing is an even smaller fraction of narcissists, those who fall on the extreme end of the continuum into the malignant psychopathic side of things. These individuals not only exhibit five or more classic narcissistic traits such as grandiosity, arrogance, entitlement, exploitation, lack of empathy, envy, superiority, and an insatiable need for validation, but they also display heightened levels of paranoia, cruelty, and an even greater deficit in empathy compared to the average narcissist. A malignant narcissist uses the powers of coercive control, mind control, and psychological abuse in a way that makes them very destructive. It's these types of people that can drive their victims to become admitted to hospitals, checked into the psychiatric ward, or commit suicide. And when you add spirituality into the mix, the consequences become even more sinister and diabolical. But listen, don't be discouraged. God is much greater than the most grandiose narcissist or cult leader. He can rival any one of them, just as he did with King Pharaoh and King Herod and win every time. So take everything I share here as knowledge that can keep you and others from perishing because 2 Corinthians 2.11 tells us that we should not be unaware of the enemy's schemes. And we are also told that without knowledge, God's people perish. And most of all, he that is in you is greater than he that is in this world. So let's keep moving forward. Now let's get into the things to watch out for. And remember, this is about a leader who practices most of the things I'm about to share in addition to having narcissistic traits that make them dangerous. So here goes. Number one, a covert religious malignant narcissist presents as extremely pious, 
so pious that their spirituality can cause you to feel like you can never measure up to their lofty standards of how they live out their faith. But behind it all, these types of leaders are secretly addicted to things like sex, money, fame, or power. And all of them are definitely addicted to the adulation, praise, and validation of man. They depend on a following to feed the deep, empty abyss inside of their souls. And they are so good at compartmentalizing, living a spiritual, pious life outwardly, while living a dark, hidden life in secret that is a contradiction to everything they preach about or stand for. Number two. These leaders completely distort Paul's teaching about being all things to all people. Paul the Apostle, in his quest to save others, adapted himself to connect with people without compromising the core message of the gospel or his personal values. He willingly set aside his freedoms and humbled himself to help others discover the truth of Jesus Christ. But when it comes to malignant narcissists, cult leaders, Their strategy involves mirroring people to gain loyalty, but the mirroring is not about leading them to salvation or serving them. Rather, it's about getting intel on them and winning their trust in order to manipulate them spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically to fulfill their own agenda, which is driven by narcissism. Narcissists distort the teachings of becoming all things to all people because they are chameleons that lack a stable inner core. Their fragmented persona allows them to live double lives, creating a facade of hypocrisy. As I mentioned, they can preach one thing and live in stark contrast because of their compartmentalized thinking and lifestyle. Number three, malignant narcissist ministry leaders subtly recreate a brand new religion that resembles the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teachings of the Bible, but it is not the same gospel. They can preach all the right verses from scripture, but with major distortions. We are warned in scripture by the apostle Paul, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Some malignant narcissists may preach very sound doctrine, but not practice any of it. In fact, they may use biblical teachings as a front to cover a deeper agenda that people don't find out about until they're way deep into the cult. Jesus said about the religious leaders who had similar traits as malignant narcissists, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Number four, covert malignant narcissists can be incredibly charming, self-effacing, and humble. I'm not talking about narcissists who are outwardly full of themselves. I'm talking about people who are so covert, people who present as winsome, self-effacing, humble, super endearing, and kind. For these types of people, you need supernatural revelation from God because they can fool even the most discerning of people. Remember that the disciples did not discern that Judas betrayed Jesus, even though they walked and ate with him for three years. It may have been in the aftermath of it all that the disciples replayed their three-year history with Judas and, in hindsight, saw the very subtle red flags all along. And that is often the case when you discover that the person you looked up to and trusted is a cult leader, a malignant narcissist, or psychopath, and your relationship with them was a lie. This type of personality can wreak massive destruction in the body of Christ because the damage they do is so deep, it can cause people to walk away from God. It is a very serious thing, and that's why I'm so passionate about speaking about these things. So how does this kind of benevolent narcissism play out in ministry? 
It is when you have a leader who love bombs by creating an atmosphere of care and affection to win people's hearts and their loyalty, particularly young, naive, vulnerable people. How might they create this atmosphere? In many different ways. They might tease people, spend lots of quality time with them, come up with special nicknames for people to make them feel special and unique. They may give gifts and do sacrificial things or act like the mother or father that the person they're targeting never had, or giving special privileged attention, or using their power and influence to open doors of opportunity that their victims could not get otherwise. Number five, the thing to understand about love bombing is that love bombing is not a gesture of love. It is a form of abuse. It is the first stage in the cycle of narcissistic abuse and there's no loving sentiment involved. There could be idealization, but that is not equal to love. It is a closer cousin to envy and idolatry. It's possible that while showering others with affection, deep down the malignant narcissist harbors contempt. The truth is that love bombing takes a monumental effort for a malignant narcissist because it is not in their nature. It is so far from their nature, so it is exhausting but they see it purely as an investment in order to achieve their own agenda. Narcissists tend to view the people they love bomb condescendingly. They see the people they love bomb as weak or pathetic for needing this love investment from them. They consider these kinds of emotional needs as beneath them. So they look at their followers with a sense of superiority. They may even speak negatively about the very people who remain loyal to them all the while portraying a loving facade to others. They don't view them as people with their own God-given destinies, but as objects to further their agenda, as things that can be replaced. The malignant narcissist betrays those very people who trust them. Number six, these leaders are remarkably gifted or intelligent. They might have excellent oratory skills and be extremely well-spoken and articulate. Their gifting mixed with their hard work ethic causes them to rise heads and shoulders over their peers and have a lot of influence. And if they are doing charitable works, well, then they are seen as doing a lot of good for a community. So the gifts and good works of a malignant narcissist create tremendous cognitive dissonance when people discover that the person practices evil and lives the opposite of everything they preach and teach about and supposedly stand for. But the reason a malignant narcissist acts so charitably and benevolently is because that is the kind of image they wish to portray about themselves to the world. Because that adulation and honor and reverence from the people who follow them is what feeds their insatiable thirst for narcissistic supply. Number seven, these leaders are highly visionary driven by their grandiosity and preoccupation with fame and success. They attract authentic, genuine, hardworking, caring individuals who aspire to contribute meaningfully and who love to be part of a bigger cause than themselves. The narcissist's chameleon-like ability to connect with people allows them to bring together a diverse community into a unified whole they're always on the lookout for new recruits to bring into the fold of their grandiose vision. The malignant narcissist also views other ministries, works, or initiatives as subpar, as inferior, and not on the same spiritual plane of relevance or importance as what they are doing. For those who have favor with this kind of leader, the feeling can be quite otherworldly. They get to be part of something larger than themselves. They get to be part of a community for the greater good and connected with quality people that are their people, their tribe. They get to connect with individuals that they might not otherwise have gotten to connect with. And that can be an incredible experience. It creates a high 
like heaven on earth. These charismatic, malignant, narcissist leaders possess a unique ability to unite people around a common vision, bringing together a diverse group of individuals constantly. And so many needs get met in a person's soul when this happens, when a person is in a group where there is a sense of belonging and love and purpose. Unfortunately, when things start feeling off and they begin questioning, these individuals find themselves sidelined, vilified, and shamed. Number eight, malignant narcissists love to take on lofty titles. They love to be called apostle or prophet or reverend or doctor. Now, I'm not saying that people who call themselves these titles are cult leaders or malignant narcissists. I'm just saying that malignant narcissists, because of their grandiose view of themselves and their belief that they are special and unique, often take pride in and hide behind such titles. And they will not take kindly to dishonoring people who fail to treat them with the utmost courtesy and reverence. If you're dealing with a malignant narcissist or cult leader, there are some who are in ministry who call themselves apostles or prophets and use that title and position to absolve themselves from having to follow Jesus's commandment to love others and to walk in the same compassion that God had. But the problem is that to be an apostle is to be a father or mother. And Paul says, you have many teachers and prophets and leaders, but you only have one father. The true test of an apostle is whether they are a father more than anything else, and also whether they demonstrate humble service to those they say they are leading. Number nine, it's a red flag when you have a prophet or apostle who has many narcissistic traits and who also thinks in very black and white terms, but does not have love. Chances are you are dealing with a narcissist who is developmentally arrested, who has not matured enough to relate to people in a way where they can hold together the complexities of what makes people human the whole package of the good, the bad, and the ugly all together. People like this can only see others as either all good or all bad or for them or against them. So be careful of people who relate to others in this way, where they villainize people as soon as they disappoint or disagree. It is a sign of emotional and spiritual immaturity, arrested development that can easily turn into manipulation. Number 10. These types of leaders talk in monologues. They're not interested in your ideas or hearing you speak, but they're only interested in you executing for them. They may go through the motions of making it seem like they are working as a team with you, but what they're really looking for underneath it all is a group of individuals or people who will do their bidding, who will take hits for them, who will be their flying monkeys, and who will execute their agenda. Number 11, these people can appear to be the most sacrificial to their cause, so it creates an air of super spirituality where people automatically look up to them and try to emulate them. They may have a cause to help the poor, but they don't confront evil. In fact, behind the scenes, they associate with shady people. I'm not talking here about leaders who hang out with immoral people for the sake of winning souls or introducing people to Jesus Christ. I'm talking about leaders who are friends with shady people and have affinities of the soul with them. Birds of a feather flock together. There is something impure about a spiritual leader that is friends with shady people. It's an indication of something about them. King David, who was a man after God's heart, says he did not associate with evildoers. He says, I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. There's something off when you have a person who purports to serve the lowly, the marginalized, the poor, but when it comes to sin, they have more mercy and compassion for evildoers than the victims of evildoers. These leaders have a misplaced allegiance. They do not confront evil, but cover it. And God has a big issue with this. He says, you tolerate Jezebel. One of the things God had against most kings in the Bible, even the ones that followed him, was that they didn't stand up to evil and darkness and the idolatry of their day. The Bible says about many kings throughout the Old Testament, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but, and there's often a big but, 
The high places, however, were not removed. That is the story about so many kings in the Bible. Ephesians 5.11 says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So God is not just looking for loyal followers. When it comes to following God, there are two sides to the same coin, following his ways and confronting evil. Number 12, here's another insidious thing you may see with male cult leaders or malignant narcissist leaders. They may place in front of them as a sort of buffer between them and the public, a soft, nurturing, kind, sweet, disarming, pastoral type of a woman to take the focus off any hardness and callousness that is in them. If a malignant narcissist who has zero empathy and compassion for people can partner himself with a woman who is completely opposite of all that, who is virtuous and sweet, it really boosts up their image, their trust, their credibility and likability in the public. And if you read up on cult leaders like Jim Jones and Keith Rainier, they had these types of women around them to do their bidding. That is how they got away with luring so many people into their cults because they would get vulnerable, good-hearted people who wanted to do good to do their bidding for them. And these were very disarming people and they became the face to the public. A cult leader may choose a group of highly pastoral, disarming people to be part of their inner circle, to be a front for them. Malignant narcissists focus highly on relationships, but not for the reasons that we do. For them, they need certain relationships and associations and affiliations to look credible in the eyes of the people they're trying to convert to their cause. And number 13, the last one I'll be sharing, malignant narcissists are paranoid. So they are worried about the government tracking them down. They're worried about paper trails. They're worried about all kinds of things. So they do things very covertly. They may not even have their names officially on documents, on their organizations, on their charities, or on anything in order to protect themselves from being incriminated in any way. They may use devices that cannot be tracked. A lot of what they do is shrouded in secrecy. They will have people who are their yes-men who will be a front for them so they don't have to be tracked down in any way or to answer to anyone, whether that's the government or any person in authority. They don't appreciate having to be under anybody's laws, so they avoid having to be scrutinized by any rules or laws. So I just shared with you 13 subtle ways that the narcissism of a covert malignant narcissist plays out in a church or ministry context. To summarize, these people present as super pious but are two-faced. They behave like chameleons to gain favor and trust. Number three, they create a new religion that mirrors Christianity but it is not true Christianity. Number four, they are self-effacing and charming. Number five, they love bomb. Number six, they are remarkably gifted and attract wonderful, hardworking, caring people to make their dreams come true. Number seven, they are highly visionary and preoccupied with fame and success. Number eight, they may insist on lofty titles. Number nine, they think in black and white, all good or all bad. They villainize people who disappoint or disagree with them. 10, they speak in monologues without true interest in others. Number 11, they can appear so sacrificial but live an ugly double life. Number 12, they use high trust, sweet pastoral people as a buffer to lend more credibility to themselves. And number 13, they are paranoid. What do you do if you suspect a leader like this? It can be very difficult because even though the leader and the system may be corrupt, you still have very sweet, authentic, well-meaning people in your community that you love dearly, with whom you have formed a deep connection. And there's still a sense of family and community, and the work can still be meaningful. You could be dealing with a leader who is extremely intelligent, who does accomplish good things, and who may believe that the ends justifies the means. And you may still enjoy the work or the vision. And so all of these things can be devastating, absolutely devastating. It might be very tempting to want to turn a blind eye because of what it could cost you if the whole thing fell apart or you had to walk away from it because it would create such a vacuum in your life. And maybe you've invested so much already. So how do you swallow all of that? None of this is a surprise to God. 
He knew what you would go through. He knew what your leader would be like and allowed it to happen. And his ways are not our ways. His purposes and his ways are much higher than ours. So there's something about believing that God has your back, even in all of this, and that there's a higher good in it all. If you need to process more what you're in and what's going on, it can be very confusing to do it while you're still in the same environment that could be toxic. One of the things you could do if you suspect you might be in a toxic situation is start to look outward and change your scenery. See if you can go somewhere else and unplug for a while and process with God somewhere. Take a leave of absence or take a trip. Do something to change the scenery so you can have a different perspective and be in a different place. It's very difficult to get clarity when you're in something, but often when you come out of something for a while, that can really help to shed light on some things that are difficult to see while you're in it. So while you may be trying to process and sort things out, take a sabbatical, spend time with God, go somewhere completely different, change geographical locations. I would also start listening to different voices and different perspectives and find a third neutral person, a trustworthy, God-fearing, godly person who is not part of that system you're in that you can talk with objectively, who could help you sort things out. The reason you want to remove yourself and get other voices and another counselor who's not part of the system is because of the propensity for groupthink to happen. Groupthink can happen when everybody is taught the same thing where they have to ascribe to one person's teachings and everyone has the same blind spots. That is a dangerous place to be no matter how well-meaning people around you are. They can be well-meaning and deceived. So you want to guard against the effects of groupthink by inviting other voices from other people who are working in other vineyards who could speak about the situation. And of course, spending time with God and knowing that he has a good plan for you. His plans are to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And Romans 8.28 says that God works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So even if this feels devastating, like you have lost something so valuable, God is working something good for you, even through all of this. Take time to get close to God to see what is the next thing he has for you. If you recognize that you need to get out and would like help with that on how to execute that, I have created a video on how to remove yourself from a toxic cultish church. Also, I have created a training video on how to navigate a difficult life transition successfully. So you can access that training by clicking on the link in the description box. Just remember that God is always ahead of the game and he has already made provision for you for what is next. Don't lose heart and don't throw the baby away with the bathwater. God is good and he is powerful enough to see you through this difficult time. God bless you. If you'd like to see more content from me, don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell so that you can be notified every time I upload a video. Bye for now and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.